Hello and welcome to a new series from Six Gamers. Want to skip my explanation? Don't worry, just click the timestamp in the description. Five Legendary, working title, will be a lore series with characters that are yet to make it into Hearthstone. Since lore of the cards or Storm can take a while to produce, I came up with the idea for this series. People seem to enjoy the Knights of the Frozen Throne card prediction, so I thought why not have something similar in structure to that. This way you guys get more lore in between waiting for lore of the cards episodes, the channel has a more constant flow of content and we get to have quick looks at characters that may one day make it into Hearthstone. Each episode will look at five individuals from a race. The plan for the channel moving forward is to produce these a fair amount but not to the point it slows lore of the cards down too much, have a few lore of the storm chucked in here and there and then occasional music stuff. Since the music isn't exactly popular, it's something I produce because I enjoy doing it, I'll only post that kind of stuff when I've made complete albums. So it will pop up extremely rarely. Anyway, let's get on shall we? In our first episode, we'll be looking at five legendary dragons that could one day make their way to Hearthstone, starting with Coriolstras, or Crassus in his mortal form. Coriolstras was once the prime consort of the red dragon aspect Alex Straza, and has had most of his tale told through the Warcraft novels. Taking on the form of a high elf, Crassus would become a member of the Council of Six, the ruling council of the mage city-state Dalaran. During the second war between orcs and humans, to Crassus's shock and horror, the orcs were able to capture his queen. The orcs forced her into laying eggs so that the green-skinned brutes could later use the dragons as mounts in their war with the Alliance. The orcs would eventually lose this war, but the Dragonmoor orc clan stationed in Grimbatol would remain at large. They had not relinquished their control of Alex Straza. Many members of the Alliance gave up on trying to defeat these orcs. Crassus, however, would never give up trying to release his love. The gifted but rash young mage Ronin was being sent by the Kirin Tor on an observation mission to the region of Karsmadan, where Grimbatol was located. Crassus would alter these instructions telling the young mage that he would be freeing Alex Straza. During this time, the mad black dragon aspect, Deathwing, was at large. The giant drake loathed the other aspects, and Crassus suspected that if Ronin succeeded in his mission, Deathwing may seize the opportunity to pounce on the weakened red aspect and slaughter her. In anticipation of this, Crassus attempted to approach the other dragon aspects, Ysera, Malagos and Nosdormu, as only they were powerful enough to compete with Deathwing. They declined as Deathwing was still more powerful than them, having tricked them to relinquish a portion of their powers to an artifact called the Dragon Soul. Paranoid the Alliance were coming for them having discovered Ronin, the Orc Necro Skullcrusher sought to move the Dragon Moor's operations. During the move of the Dragon Queen was when Coriolstras chose to strike, but not before the Black Dragon. Deathwing too had been aiming for the Orcs to leave Grim Batol, not to kill Alex Straza, but to steal her eggs to raise as his own. In the ensuing battle, Alex Straza's eldest consort, Tyrannostras, would fall to Deathwing, the other aspects would lend their aid, Ronin would destroy the Dragon Soul, giving the aspects their power back, Deathwing would flee, heavily wounded, and Alex Straza would be freed. Crassus would embark on another adventure with Ronin when the bronze aspect Nosdormu called him for aid. The Timeless One was desperately trying to keep together a rip in time. To repair it, Crassus and Ronin were flung back in time 10,000 years ago to the first invasion of the demonic Burning Legion. Several factors made it look as if this time the Legion would succeed, but thanks to aid from Crassus and Ronin, the races of Azeroth defeated the Legion. Crassus returned to his role as an observer of the mortal races, but even he was unable to stop the destructive march of the Scourge, heralding the second arrival of the Burning Legion. Once again, the mortal races prevailed, but the High Elves, now called Blood Elves, had sustained great losses, most of their race being murdered and their font of power, the Sunwell, 
being corrupted. Upon returning to his kingdom, Prince Kael'thas would destroy the corrupted Sunwell. After the Sunwell's destruction, Crassus noticed the reaccumulation of the Sunwell's power. Not wanting the corrupted Prince Arthas to discover this power, Coriolstras reformed it into the human avatar Avena Teague. The Red Dragon played a role in stopping the elf Darkarn from draining Avena completely of her power. Later, Crassus would return to Grim Batol where he would discover Syntharia, a contender for this list and once the consort of Deathwing, creating the Twilight Dragonflight. With help from Ronin, Verisa Windrunner, Iridi, Rom, Zeraku, and a later entrant on this list, Syntharia, then going by the name Sinestra, and her greatest creation, Dragonax, were defeated. Crassus made his first and only appearance in WoW during the Wrath of the Lich King expansion giving the final quest to defeat Malagos, who had declared war on mortal spellcasters. Not long after the return of Deathwing caused the Cataclysm, Coriolstras would meet his end. The Wormrest Accord would meet, but Crassus, not too popular with the Blues, would instead head to the Ruby Sanctum to check on his flight's eggs. Crassus would destroy himself and the eggs in all the dragon sanctums to prevent the spread of a mutation forced upon the hatchlings by the Twilight's Hammer Cult. The next dragon helped give birth to the Aspects as we know them today, the evil gargantuan proto-dragon Galakrond. Once like other proto-drakes, Galakrond suddenly turned. It is vaguely hinted that this was partly due to the actions of the titanic watcher, Tyr. Galakrond would go on to terrorise his own kind, growing to a size so large that it dwarfed all the present day aspects combined. The giant fed on his own kind. Those that were cannibalised would later return as undead, bound to Galakron's will, called the Not Living. With every dragon that fell, Galakron's forces grew, and any dragon the Not Living bit would soon also be consumed by the disease that infected them. Some tried to ingratiate themselves with Galakrond. They were consumed. Some tried to fight the beast. They were consumed. Eventually, Galakrond had consumed so much of the life essence of his fellow proto-dragons that he too appeared to be changing into undead. His flesh greyed, was covered in decay, and mutations sprung up all over the dragon's body extra limbs and eyes. Galakron's breath attack would change into a sickly green mist, which would either drain those that flew into it of all their energy, or send them into a wild, uncontrollable rage. Eventually, Galakron's reign of terror would end, defeated by the present-day aspects in their proto-dragon forms, aided by Tyr. With Galakron's death, the Titanic Watchers blessed the proto-dragons instrumental in Galakron's defeat, transforming them into the dragon aspects, and giving birth to dragon kind as we know it today. Chromie is our next entrant onto this list, or Chronormu if going by her dragon name. Taking on the guise of a gnome, this bronze drake often finds herself tangled in mortal affairs. She first came into contact with mortals while investigating Anderhol on behalf of the bronze flight, the site of many horrific scourge experimentations. With Chromie's help, adventurers were able to defeat the Lich, Araj the Summoner, who controlled Anderhol. Chromie, unusually social for a bronze drake, would spend more time with mortals and as a result become more sympathetic toward their struggles. Using her time-bending powers, she helped Joseph Redpath, a soldier of the Alliance who fought in the Battle of Darrowshire, cleansing his spirit of Scourge corruption. Chromie was the bronze representative of the Wormrest Accord at Wormrest Temple, but rather than tackling the Lich King or dealing with Malagos, much of Chromie and the Bronze Flight's energies were spent battling the Infinite Dragonflight. This flight had first surfaced in the Burning Crusade expansion, trying to alter past events. They tried to stop Thrall from escaping his human masters, and Medivh from summoning the Orcs to Azeroth. Chromie would help prevent them change another past event, as the Infinite Flight tried to prevent Arthas from purging the city of Stratholme. 
She's made small appearances throughout World of Warcraft, likely due to her being the second most recognisable bronze dragon after the aspect Nosdormu. She appeared in the Well of Eternity instance. Heroes going back in time to collect the Dragon Soul to battle Deathwing in the present, investigated the Timeless Isle near the continent of Pandaria, an island that drifted in and out of the mist surrounding the continent where time seemed to have no hold. She would aid in the trial of Garrosh Hellscream, showing the court visions of the past so that witnesses could not misremember details. She aided the prosecutor Tyrande Whisperwind with these visions, while her contemporary Kairos Dormu aided Garrosh's reluctant defendant, Bane Bloodhoof. Chromie suspected Kairos of tampering with the artifact, the Vision of Time, which showed the events. When he revealed he had, he imprisoned Chromie and freed Garrosh, taking them back 35 years into the past to an alternate timeline where the Orcs were uncorrupted. Chromie would aid in the hunt for the treacherous Kairos, only to find he had already been killed by Garrosh. In the Legion expansion, Chromie finds out she will die in the near future, but knew this was not her intended time to die, having seen that previously. Someone had been tampering with the timeways against everything the Bronze Dragonflight stood for. While it was likely the Burning Legion who were responsible, it was never found out who exactly plotted Chromie's death, but the timelines were restored. Sticking with the Bronze Flight, well, kind of, Murazond is our next entrant. The aspect of the infinite dragonflight was once Nosdormu, from a time that is not our own. When blessed with his powers over time, Nosdormu's possible arrogance that could stem from such power was nipped in the bud by the Watchers, showing the dragon his own death. The Nosdormu who would become Murazon would be tormented by this vision and then later tricked by the old gods into trying to subvert his mortality. Shattering the timeways, Murazon created the infinite flight and now existed outside of time, no longer a slave to its march. The old gods' grand scheme for Murazon was to have his flight erased thrall from history so that the orc that would later become the wild shaman could not prevent the Hour of Twilight, the end of Azeroth. Murazon himself would be defeated in the End Time instance, depicting a bleak future for Azeroth, but the Infinite Flight lives on. Finally, we come to the Dragon Aspect, who isn't just an evil version of a current one, that's not in the game. Malagos's replacement, Kalikgos. Kalik was sent to Quel'Thalas to investigate the residual energies of what appeared to be the Sunwell. Discovering Avena, the two became friends. Kalik would defend Avena from the attacks of Dark Khan, who sought to claim her power. Kalik would later discover Avena was the Sunwell. Having grown attached to Avena, possibly romantically, Kalik stayed behind with the Avatar to help rebuild the Blood Elves Kingdom. That was until the return of Kael'thas Sunstrider, the Prince of the Blood Elves now allied with the Burning Legion. They kidnapped Avena and sought to use her powers to bring the demon lord killed Jaden to Azeroth. In his desperation to free Avena, Kalik would become possessed by the dreadlords Sathravar the Corrupt. After being freed from his possession by adventurers, Kalik would aid them fight an arriving Kill Jaden, the demon stuck between worlds. The battle would end when Avena sacrificed herself and restored the full power of the Sunwell to the Blood Elven race. A depressed Kalik would be sent to investigate Grim Batol, being part of the party that thwarted Syntharia's plans. Kalik would not take part in Malagos' war upon the mortal races for their overuse of magic, as he did not agree with the aspect. He would, however, act as an ambassador for the Blue Flight as part of the Wormrest Accord. After Malagos' defeat, a new aspect needed to be chosen, and Kalik and Ergos were the two most likely successors. Ergos wished his kind to withdraw from the world, forging their own destiny, while Kalik felt the Blue should take an active role in world affairs. Kalik would become the new aspect, and with his newfound powers, needed to drive off an attack from Ergos and the Chromatic Dragonflight. The Blue, having been allied with Deathwing, 
all along. Kallik was instrumental in the defeat of the mightiest chromatic dragon Chromatus and the final defeat of Deathwing. Upon Deathwing's defeat, the Aspects became mortal, still very powerful, but a lot of their power had gone. It seemed they had received their Titan-given powers for this one moment, to help stop Deathwing from bringing about the Hour of Twilight. The powerful magical artifact, the Focusing Iris, was stolen from the Blue Flight, and Kallik went off in search of it. During his travels, he befriended Jaina Proudmoore, the two later becoming lovers. The Iris had been stolen by the Horde under the command of Garrosh Hellscream. With it, they levelled Theramore, which Jaina watched over. Kallik tried to aid her, but ultimately failed. Taking the Iris, fueled by rage, Jaina sought to flood Orgrimmar beneath the crushing might of a magically fueled tidal wave. Kallik was able to talk her down. What few blue dragons remain are now able to pursue their own paths. The flight disbanded. Kallik is now a member of the Council of Six in Dalaran, even after his lover left in a rage when the Council agreed to allow members of the Horde back into Dalaran. Kallik now aids in the Third War against the Burning Legion. With that extremely short summary of Kallik, we come to the end of our episode. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, share, and subscribe. What would you like to see next? Trolls? Elves? Beasts? Any suggestions? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, happy hearthstoning.